so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. This episode is about real life events. It contains discussions of sexual assault and abuse. Listener discretion is advised. It's winter 1978 and Trudy Jeanette Adams is standing on the side of Baron Joey Road outside Newport Surf Life Saving Club. Baron Joey Road is an urban stretch of road that connects a number of suburbs on Sydney's northern beaches. Spanning for 15 kilometres, a driver could begin in Mona Vale, pass through Newport, then Bilgola, Avalon, until they reached Palm Beach, best known today as the location of TV show Home and Away. But in June 1978, the northern beaches were quieter. Picturesque, laid back and beachy, they were known for the sand and the sea, but also for the expansive Karingai Chase National Park, which spans as far as the eye can see. It's dark, and the late hours of Saturday night have turned into the early hours of Sunday morning. Trudy wants to go home. When she exits Newport Surf Life Saving Club, she walks along Baron Joey Road, attempting to hitchhike the six-minute journey home to Avalon. A car pulls up. She gets in. That was almost 43 years ago. And the blonde teenager, a business college student with a holiday book to Bali, was never seen again. I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with award-winning investigative journalists Ruby Jones and Neil Mercer, co-authors of the book Baron Joey Road. Ruby Jones first investigated the case for ABC's Unravel podcast. The second season, titled Baron Joey Road, looked into the disappearance of Trudy Adams. The ABC then produced the three-part documentary series with Jones and Mercer under the same name. It was just after midnight when Trudy Adams left a dance in Newport. What do you know, Ruby, about what happened next? So, I mean, the sad part of all of this is after Trudy Adams left that dance, we don't really know what happened to her at all. So we know that on the night that she disappeared, she'd been with a couple of friends. She'd been to a pub earlier on in the night and then when that was closing up after 10 p.m., her and a few of her friends, they drove to the Newport Surf Club, which is this big surf club right on the beach at Newport Beach. There were dancers there fairly often. There was uh, a lot of local bands that played and these dancers were really popular. There was always a lot of people there, a lot of teenagers. There was, you know, drinks that you could buy at the bar. There was always people milling around in the car park and down by the surf and on the dance floor as well. So Trudy and her friends arrived there after 10 p.m. on this particular night. We know that Trudy went inside the surf club. People said that she was complaining a little bit at certain points in the night because she'd recently gotten some vaccinations for a trip to Bali that she was about to take. So she was saying that she wasn't feeling too well, but she was having a pretty good time. She was taking sips out of friends' drinks during the night. She was trying to save money for this trip, so she wasn't really spending money herself. She was a bit broke at the time, so she was just having a pretty normal night. And then At a certain point, we know that she saw her boyfriend at the time called Steve Norris. They were actually in the process of breaking up. He asked her to dance. She said that she didn't want to dance with him and she then went to leave the surf club. So she left just after midnight. We know that Steve Norris saw her leave. He saw her walk down the stairs and cross the car park. He decided to go after her. He was worried. He thought that she was probably going to hitchhike home, which was very common. Everyone did it. And so he went down after her. He saw her cross the road to this specific spot where a lot of people went to go and hitchhike. And 
As he was looking at her, a car pulled up, a panel van, a beige-coloured panel van. He said he saw it pull up and then when it left again, Trudy was no longer standing there and that is the last time that anyone saw her alive. And how quickly did people start to fear for Trudy? Because as you say, she was a young woman who was out. She didn't come home the next morning. When was the alarm raised that something had gone very wrong? The alarm went off fairly quickly because, as Ruby described, Steve Norris left the dance himself. He was a bit worried about her. So he made his way to Trudy's home and Trudy's mum, Connie, was sitting up waiting for her. And there was a brief conversation between the two of them. I think Steve had a cigarette and said something like, don't worry, she'll turn up. And he left. She still wasn't home the next morning. And that was most unlike Trudy Adams. If she was going to stay out with a girlfriend or whatever, she would always phone her mum or dad. Her brothers were the same. So by you know early the next morning, her mother, Connie, is very distressed. She wants her husband, who was known by his nickname Edge, His middle name was Edgecombe. Connie wanted him to go to the police on the Sunday morning. He says, well, hang on, let's wait and see. Maybe she stayed with a friend. Maybe she stayed with one of her friends. Let's ring around. Let's not go to the police just yet. Friends started to call in looking for Trudy. Connie was phoning her friends. This is the Sunday, June 25, 1978. There was a barbecue on that day that Trudy had been really looking forward to because, as Ruby said, she was in the process of maybe breaking up with Steve Norris. And this birthday party was for a a young bloke that Trudy had her eye on. She didn't turn up there. And that's when everybody really got worried. Connie, I think, phoned the local police station about 9 o'clock. And at 10 o'clock on the Sunday night, her husband went to the police station and formally reported her missing. It wasn't until the next day, that's the Monday, that the police actually sent out an official message via telex machine. That was the state of the technology back then alerting other police stations and police vehicles that she was missing. So it was on the Monday night that police first sent out the alert that Trudy Jeanette Adams was missing and there were fears for her safety. And the first line of inquiry appeared to be Steve Norris himself because they had been arguing that night. Did police interview him? Did he have an alibi? Where did that line of inquiry go? Yeah, so Steve Norris was the police's first suspect. Um, They have been very open about that and Steve himself has acknowledged that, yep, he kind of understood that straight away suspicion was going to fall to him as the person who had been Trudy's boyfriend and also as the last person to see her alive as well. So those were the two main reasons. There are some conflicting reports about whether or not Trudy and Steve had a fight on that night. He says that they didn't fight. He said that he was just asking her to dance and she was saying no and it wasn't actually a fight. But I think what happened was there was some initial reporting. Some of the the very early newspaper reports did say that there was a fight. And so I think that muddied the waters a bit. Steve Norris was interviewed multiple times by police and we have copies of those early interviews, transcripts of police asking him about what happened. And he has said that he saw her leave and then when he did see her leave. He was worried about her. He wanted to go after her and make sure that she was okay. And he got into a car straight away. So he actually hitchhiked as well after her. The person who picked him up was an acquaintance from the Northern Beaches. He remembers that trip well. He remembers Steve getting into the car and he remembers dropping Steve off near Trudy's house. And Steve, as we know, went in and spoke to Trudy's mum. And then after that, headed off home and then for the next few days was, uh, you know, as worried as everyone about what had happened to, to Trudy. I think an important point to make there is that when the police first notified other police stations, when they sent out that wireless message, 31 it was called, on the Monday evening after she's disappeared, they say or they said she was last seen getting into a green combi and heading north. The Green Combi was then, is now, a source of mystery as to where that description came from because the police had been to see Connie and her husband. It's not clear where they got the Green Combi from because Steve, when he was interviewed, I think it was the next day, formally interviewed, he said, no, no, it was a beige or fawn Holden panel van. And he was a man who knew his cars. He, he could identify models and that sort of thing. 
So the investigation from the very start was confused a bit because of this green combi, and that would resonate down through the decades. And once Steve Norris was ruled out, another theory emerged, which was about Trudy potentially being a drug mule and this trip to Bali maybe presenting some danger to her. What did that theory entail? When Trudy Adams disappeared, there were, as is often the case in in these sort of things, there were a lot of rumours swirling around. At that time, the northern beaches, it's a beautiful, magnificent part of Sydney, magnificent beaches, great surfing, a lot of surfers, and people were going to Bali, and some of them were bringing back what are called Buddha sticks, marijuana wrapped around like popsicles and that sort of stuff. I think you could buy them for $1.40 in Bali at the time and sell them back here in Sydney for about 10 bucks. So there was a bit of dope smoking going on in the northern beaches, no surprise there. But these rumours started to go around that she was going to be what we now call, I guess, a drug mule. And those rumours started circulating. And the police really tried hard to pin that down. Ruby, can you describe for anyone who hasn't been to Baron Joey Road or seen that area, what it's like because you actually went there as part of the investigation. How would you describe it? We spent so many hours on the northern beaches of Sydney as part of our investigation trying to talk to people. And the thing about the northern beaches is everybody remembers this case. It really did change that part of Sydney forever. And it's a very specific part of Sydney. You cross the bridge over into the area that we sort of broadly know as the northern beaches. And it is sort of like being in a small town or a village or I guess a series of little villages because there are all of these little sandy beaches all the way up to the tip of the peninsula. Each one has its own sort of distinct flavour, but they really just do feel like small towns. Within every little cove, everybody knows everyone else. Everyone has grown up there together. There is a, a strong sense of community and It's also one of the most beautiful places in the world. It really is. The beaches are stunning. The ocean is absolutely gorgeous. And then the way that it sort of looks is you have these stunning beaches and then you have Barrenjoy Road itself, which tracks all the way up to the tip of the peninsula. And then on the other side of Barrenjoy Road, you have this very dense, thick bushland, which is a national park now, Karingai Chase National Park. And so It's this really stunning area full of natural beauty and especially so back in 1978 where there weren't that many people that lived there really. It wasn't very populated. And so, yeah, a lot of natural beauty but also just I guess a lot of a lot of bush, a lot of space in which, you know, you didn't really necessarily know what was out there or what was happening. They used to call it, or they still do actually, because it's sort of so separated from Sydney in some ways, the insular peninsula. People grew up there together, they went to school together, they still live in the same area, they don't leave and when you look at the natural beauty you can understand why. And on that, an enormous search ensued and as you say there is a lot of land to cover, particularly that national park. When you looked back on that search and what police did, did you get the sense that that search was well conducted and that police did everything they could to find Trudy in those first few weeks? I think that for the time, it was a good search. I mean, we're talking about 1978. They didn't have the kinds of things that we do now and the kind of resources that would be available now. But there was a huge effort. There were a lot of police who were part of this search. And there was also a huge community effort. They really did rally everyone who lived in the area to come out and search. And they did do line searches. So this was people kind of standing arms width apart, all walking in a line together to make sure that they covered every single inch of bush that they could. So I think that the search itself, they definitely were thorough, but I would say that the vast area of that bushland is, you know, a huge challenge. Yeah, the Homicide Squad, the New South Wales Homicide Squad, was called in about four or five days after Trudy disappeared. On the day they arrived, I think it was the Thursday after the weekend she disappeared, Connie Adams, Trudy's mum, got a call at home. It was an anonymous call, a man who apparently had a deep voice, and he just said, it was an accident, she's halfway up Mona Vale Road. About 10 minutes later, the same person apparently phoned one of the local police stations, and said exactly the same thing. It was an accident. She's halfway up Mona Vale Road. And so the police didn't know whether that was a hoax, whether it was the killers trying to put them off the track, but they really didn't have any 
choice but to do the searches described by Ruby. And they went on for 15 days. I think it involved, in the end, over a 1,000 people, including many, many, many members of the local community. But Kuingai Chase National Park is, I think, 150 square kilometres. Parts of it are incredibly rugged, and it would just be impossible to search the whole thing. So I agree with Ruby. I think at the time they did their level best. But I think what ended up happening was that while this search was occurring, it started to become obvious that there had been some other women who had been attacked. And those other women that had been attacked, as you say, started coming forward. What did their stories have in common? Their stories were all very similar. The details of what happened to all of these women, and we don't know the exact number. There was 14 women who came forward originally. That number has grown in subsequent police investigations. And after we did our investigation, we had more women contact us as well. So the true number, we will never know, I don't think. But the women had very similar stories. Most of them were hitchhiking or you know, about to hitchhike or they were waiting for public transport and then had been offered a lift. Most of the attacks happened on weekends in the evening, so when people were sort of leaving pubs or, you know, at night trying to get home um, from going to a party, that kind of thing. There was always two men involved. It seems like both of those men wore some form of disguise often, whether that was a fake wig, that type of thing. All of the attacks involved firearms, so they had a gun that they would use to threaten the women with. They would often blindfold the women and then take them to an area of bushland which was in Kurungai Chase National Park and they would threaten the women and try and make sure that these women didn't report what had happened by saying things like saying that they were police officers so there was you know no point in them reporting it because they themselves were police officers they would sometimes offer them money that kind of thing and they would then after the attacks they would drop the women at or near their homes and they would tell the women that they knew their address and so if they told anyone that they would come back and harm them. Did any of these women come forward and report it to police before Trudy? So there was one woman in particular who had reported what had happened to her. That was in 1971. So that was seven or so years before Trudy Adams' disappearance. She had actually gone straight to the police station on the night that the attack had happened and she had attempted to report it and police actually turned her away. They said that her complaint had been doubtful and they told her to go home. Yeah, she went to the Manly Police Station and explained what had happened, that she'd in fact been walking along the beachfront in Manly outside a a hotel and had decided to walk home not far. She heard footsteps, a man following her. She turned a corner and in front of her, a man jumped out of a vehicle and pointed a gun at her. She's bundled into the car. She gets sexually assaulted. She goes to the police, as Ruby said, describes what has happened, that She's been abducted at gunpoint and handcuffed and blindfolded and raped. And it's the night shift. This is the early hours of the morning at Manly Police Station, just over the the harbour from the CBD. And the police don't believe her because her clothing's not torn. She did not scream out. She did not cry for help. A female police officer examined her and couldn't find any injuries. And because she hadn't resisted, two men with a gun who'd handcuffed her, they ticked the box doubtful. Her complaint was deemed doubtful, which was pretty extraordinary, in particular given what happened just a few days later on March 6, when two other young women, I think aged 14 and 15, went to another police station and reported that they too had been abducted while hitchhiking by two men at gunpoint, handcuffed, same MO, exactly the same. But as far as we know, that first victim, uh, we called her Jane Hampshire in the book, as far as we know, she was never re-interviewed. So those two attacks, March 1 and March 6, 1971, 50 years ago, mark the beginning of this story. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Jessie Stevens. <laughs> 
I'm speaking with award-winning investigative journalists Ruby Jones and Neil Mercer, co-authors of the book Baron Joey Road. So when these women start coming forward saying that from a place very similar to where Trudy Adams went missing, they had these experiences, did the police tie these two things together or think that perhaps they were related? Yeah, very much so. The first woman, well, she was a young girl, she was a teenager, the first one to come forward was 16 years old. She went to the police station by herself and reported the fact that she had been raped. She went by herself because she had not told her mother. She was worried her mum might berate her or not believe her, but she went to the police station. I think this was certainly within the first week of Trudy disappearing. She was 16 years old. She recounted what had happened, and she didn't want to make a formal statement at first, but she went back the next day again by herself and said she would make a statement. And what's more, she knew of other young girls who had been sexually assaulted and she told the police she would try and get them to come forward. And so she made a statement and she did in fact get two other young girls to come forward. So I think police really started to realise as these women came forward that there was two men on the northern beaches who for years had been abducting women at gunpoint, kidnapping them, raping them and scaring them so much that these women were too afraid to report what had happened. And so it was as a, a natural line of inquiry to think, well, you know, is this what happened to Trudy? Is it these two men? The police certainly thought that the rapes were almost certainly linked to Trudy's disappearance. And in particular, one of the young women who came forward described to the detectives from the Homicide Squad what had happened. She was, I think, near the Newport Arms Hotel. She might have been drinking there. She was hitching a ride. She said, I just jumped into the back of the car, didn't really look at who was in there. And one of the men in the passenger seat turned around and pointed a revolver at her. And she'd had a few drinks and she just said, you're joking. And I grabbed the gun and it went off. I heard a loud bang. And she had thought they were joking. But obviously, when the gun went off, the bullet didn't hit her. What it hit, we don't know. But police heard that story and the other stories of all these young women. One of them was hit over the head with a gun. Shots were fired to scare them. But police put all those stories together and thought this was one woman who had sought to resist. And they had been told Trudy was very feisty and she most certainly would have resisted any attack. And they thought, well, maybe that is what happened. She might have grabbed the gun as this other woman had done. The woman that lived, the bullet obviously missed her. The police thought if Trudy had done the same thing or resisted in some form, she'd been shot. And the question then would be, where is Trudy? And that's what this search was attempting to uncover. There was a discovery of a shallow grave. Who came across that and do you think that was meaningful? There was a park ranger called Brian Walker who found this shallow grave in Karingai Chase National Park. And I think what was quite terrifying about that was he actually, when he first came across this shallow grave, it seems like he disturbed someone who was in the process of digging it. So he saw this grave and he said it was quite specific. The length and the shape of it and the way in which it was dug was really the size that you would dig for a human body. And he also saw the shovel and he saw a tweed jacket hanging over this shovel. So it it really seemed to him like he had disturbed a person digging a grave. That person was probably nearby hiding in bushland. He was pretty frightened by the whole thing. He left and then he actually after thinking about it for a day or two, came back to try and find that grave. And it had been completely covered over. So the person who had dug it had obviously covered it back over. He told police about it. Police dug it out and they found nothing in there. But I think what is significant about that is that if he hadn't disturbed that person in the process of digging that grave, then would a body have ended up there? And, you know, I think that that's a a pretty scary proposition. And where were police at this point in terms of identifying who these two men who had been raping these women in the northern beaches, who they were? Did they have any place to start with the identifying features that some of these victims could recount? 
very early on, the police had a very good idea as to who was behind the rapes. More and more women came forward in the weeks after Trudy's disappearance. They described the men. One of them was described as about 35. He was a bit chubby, a bit tubby. And as the weeks went on, the police showed a number of the women photo boards of men they thought could be suspects. And several of the women picked out two men. And they were well-known criminals. They were guys by the name of Neville Tween and Ray Johnson, who had started their criminal careers. Neville Tween started his at the age of 10, and Ray Johnson started his at the age of nine. And they'd graduated, if you can call it that, through to breaking and entering, safe cracking, robbery, armed robbery, drug dealing, and in Neville Tween's case, a sexual assault in 1975, so three years before Trudy disappears. But that sexual assault in 1975, as it turned out, was on a man. And Ruby, there's a point where you look at Neville Tween because of that criminal history. He was in and out of jail frequently. But you chart when these attacks are meant to have happened and particularly when Trudy Adams happened. Is it possible that it was Neville Tween given that track record? I think it's certainly possible. I mean, you look at the timeline, because we're talking about a big period of time here between 1971 and 1978. It's a matter of years. But these attacks, they actually happened in bursts. There would be, you know, a period of weeks or months in which it seems like attacks were very frequent. They were happening on weekends during these periods of time. And if you track Neville Tween's movements, and then you also look at the dates of those attacks, what becomes clear is that When Neville Tween moves away from the Northern Beaches or is in jail, the attacks stop. And when he is released from jail and comes to the Northern Beaches, those attacks resume. There is a very clear pattern that you can mark out. In fact, in those early attacks, the 1971 attacks, in the March 6 attacks, one of the girls had a relative in the New South Wales Police Force. Interestingly, Neville Tween was spotted by police about four days later, they know nothing. The police who spotted him was from the consorting squad. They saw him in a hotel. They know he's a crook. And in those days, they would go in and sort of shake him down. And they charged him with a couple of things, including possession of a handcuff key and a few other very minor things. But interestingly enough, he bolts to South Australia. These are relatively minor charges for him. And Ruby and I have discussed this, and we wondered whether somehow he'd found out that one of his victims, If he was the attacker, one of his victims had a relative in the New South Wales police and he fled to South Australia, where he resumed his life of crime, by the way, in terms of safe cracking and robberies and made a lot of money. He made about $100,000. He got caught over there, goes to jail for several years, comes back to Sydney. So the 71 attacks stop because he suddenly leaves the state. There's clearly a fair bit linking him to it. He's a known criminal. Is he interviewed? about these rapes? Are the police onto him? This is one of the most interesting parts of our investigation and something that I still wonder about because he was clearly a suspect. He was identified as a suspect by name in this original investigation. He is suspected of all of these rapes and police are thinking that that might be what happened to Trudy. So he's very much in the frame, but he's never formally interviewed by police. And we tried to find out why that was. One police officer who we spoke to basically said that because he was such a high level criminal, there would be no point trying to just drag him into the police station and ask him if he'd done it without any evidence because he would just say, no, I didn't. You know, there'd be no way to get him to admit to doing something like that. We also, in some of the documents we found, it looks like at some point perhaps his lawyer, Neville Tween's lawyer back in the 70s when this investigation was going on, called up the homicide team and said that he knew he was acting for Neville Tween and Neville Tween knew that he was a suspect and, you know, and he hadn't done it and, you know, they should back off, words to that effect. So, It sounds like, you know, perhaps there was some sort of leak in the investigation and that Tween found out he was a suspect and, you know, because he had a lawyer, you know, police knew that it was going to be difficult to move forward on that. 
And he had a few questionable relationships with people who were in policing and sort of in in high places. What did you uncover about that in your investigation? I don't think there's any doubt that he had connections with police. We know about a couple of them, but in the 70s, I've got no doubt because of the sort of criminal he was, safe cracker, drug dealer. I mean, he wasn't big, big, big time, but he was a very serious career criminal and he was a violent man. And I'm sure he would have had relationships with police back in the 70s. We know that in the mid-80s, when he came under suspicion for a second murder, not the Trudy Adams murder, but the murder of a drug dealer, we know for a fact that he met in a car park with a detective inspector from the New South Wales Police, whom he says he'd never met before. And he met the detective inspector twice and knew he was a suspect in this second murder of the drug dealer, a guy called Tony Yelovich. So he's grilling this cop about what do people know about me? Um, No doubt he's saying it's nothing to do with me, but that's one connection. And he later, in the early 90s, establishes his big connection with a law enforcement officer, which lasted for many, many years. Neville Tween died. Was he ever convicted of any of these rapes, anything on these young women? No, he was never convicted. He was, as Ruby pointed out, he was never questioned And I remember when we were doing the investigation and the police said, look, there wasn't much point in interviewing him until we had a really good case. But in fact, they had a really good case on the rapes. They had women who had identified him. He lived very close to the area. He, in 1975, had been convicted, along with one of his mates, of sexually assaulting a 19-year-old man in Karingai Chase National Park very close to where the young women said they'd been assaulted. And it was a bizarre assault he made the young man dress in women's underwear. And Tween's accomplice then performed, they performed sexual acts on each other. The question obviously arises that where did he get the women's underwear from? And one of the very experienced police officers said to Ruby and myself, well, it's not the sort of thing a drug dealer would normally carry around. It's the sort of thing somebody like Neville Tween would keep as a trophy. So there was evidence that he lived nearby. There'd been a previous sexual assault on a man. There are these women who'd identified him. The police knew he had guns because they'd arrested him over the years in possession with guns. They knew he was violent. There was a whole lot of information pointing to him. And Police more recently who tried to go back and reinvestigate this case have said quite bluntly those rape victims did not get any form of justice. Not only was nobody ever charged, not only was Tween and Ray Johnson never charged, but he's never questioned those 14 women did not get what they deserved and that was a competent, thorough police investigation. How about in terms of Trudy Adams? Is there enough tying him and his crimes to the disappearance and probable murder of Trudy Adams? Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the big things that we grappled with in our investigation because on the one hand, while there was seemingly a lot of evidence that tied him to those rapes, nothing of Trudy's was ever found. So her body was never found none of her possessions were found. There was really no trace of her. And without any actual evidence, it's very hard to progress that any further. You know, the last person to see her alive was Steve Norris. We've got every detail that we could possibly get from him. And then after that, she disappears. And so without a body, it's incredibly difficult to be able to definitively say what happened to Trudy. You mentioned the car early on that Steve saw. Was Neville Tween at all associated with that vehicle? Yes, Neville Tween was associated with a panel van with a very similar colour, fawn to beige, at that time. He had the use of a lot of cars. That was one of the things that became apparent. The victims, as they came forward after Trudy's disappearance, reported being picked up in a panel van, a VW Beetle. There were a couple of other vehicles that were used. So there was evidence that he had a panel van at the time. 
And this is 1978. The New South Wales police, there were issues of corruption going back before the 70s, through the 70s, into the 80s, of verbaling, that is, making up confessions, loading up people, that is, planting weapons or drugs on them, on suspects. Nothing ever happened to Neville Tween or Ray Johnson like that, which, having been around in that era when those sort of things were fairly commonplace, surprises me slightly given the brutality of the crimes. I'm not saying they should have done that because it's obviously a criminal offence. But the other thing that didn't happen, as far as Ruby and I can tell in, in the investigation we did, they never mounted any surveillance on him. And they knew he and Ray Johnson were really good suspects for the rapes. There doesn't appear to have been any surveillance on him at all from the time after Trudy disappeared. They'd had surveillance on him a year or two before when he'd been allegedly involved in an armed robbery at a hotel up the North South Wales North Coast. But as far as we know, there was no surveillance in this case of Trudy or the rapes. And after about six weeks, the homicide squad went in. They couldn't find Trudy. They couldn't find any of her possessions or her clothes. They took all the statements from the young women who'd been sexually assaulted. But after about six weeks, the lead investigator was told by his boss in the homicide squad to um, finish up full time. And he says he was told words to the effect, you're a homicide investigator, not a rape investigator. And this is where it seems the case just, well, we don't really know what happened to the rape cases because they certainly weren't fully investigated. They weren't given the time they deserved. The women were not given, you know, the justice they deserved. It just seems they, and I think in the book we say something like it seemed as though they were treated as some sort of stain on the reputation of the northern beaches and best washed away by the tide because while Trudy Adams, her name or her case sort of lived on in Sydney folklore, the rapes were basically forgotten and it appears there wasn't a proper investigation. Finally, I wanted to ask how certain you two are. I know there's circumstantial evidence and that people, you know, will say that there's not enough clear evidence tying Neville Tween to Trudy Adams. How sure are you two that he was responsible for what happened to her that night? I think he's the strongest suspect. I think that much is clear. I think of all of the leads that police chased, and there were a lot of leads, there were so many people who came forward and made reports and said that they'd seen something suspicious. There were so many men who were interviewed who lived on the northern beaches or were on registries for sex offenders. There was a lot of interviews conducted. There were many lines of inquiry that were pursued, not just in 1978, but again in the 90s and then again in the late 2000s. So the amount of police hours that have been dedicated to this case is absolutely enormous. And I think what is clear from that is that Neville Tween was the strongest suspect and also that he wasn't investigated fully or properly. I agree with Ruby. I think he is the strongest suspect and... New South Wales police themselves, including some homicide investigators who came along in, well, you know, years, decades later, say he is the strongest suspect because he lived there. He was identified by the victims. They knew he had access to handcuffs. There were other crimes where he'd worn wigs. Some of the women said their attackers wore wigs. There was all this circumstantial evidence. But as Ruby rightly pointed out, there were an awful lot of predators on the northern beaches In that time, there were men following buses from Sydney CBD all the way up the northern beaches and approaching young women as they got off the buses late at night. One bus driver actually reported that to the police, and that was fully investigated. There were other men driving around, picking up young women, offering them $20 to buy their panties. There were men driving around, picking up young boys, showing them porn magazines, asking them if they'd like to earn 20 bucks. There was at least 100 sex offenders living in that area. Those were the known sex offenders. Tween is, in my mind, by far the strongest suspect, and I believe he did it. I believe he certainly raped all those women. I have no doubt about that. Whether he killed Trudy, I think he did. But is there enough evidence there? No, there's not, sadly, very sadly. Ruby Jones is an award-winning investigative journalist, documentary host and podcast host. She was the host of the Walkley Award-nominated podcast series Baron Joey Road. Neil Mercer 
is a Walkley Award-winning journalist with more than 40 years' experience as a broadcast and print journalist. Together, they wrote the book Baron Joey Road, which was released earlier this year. You can find a link to it in our show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jesse Stevens. Sound design is by Ian Camilleri and our producer is Gia Moylan. If you want to support this show, the best thing you can do is give us a review in your podcast app. Let us know what you think and what cases you'd like us to cover. And if you don't want to miss a single episode, make sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts.